Let us pray. Father, let us embrace what you have for us to hear today. How great thou art. We can scarcely understand those words, but, but as we sit in your presence and, and we worship you, today let, our, let, the, let the word be a time of worship. Break down all the old barriers. Break down those walls of the hardened heart. And let the Spirit change us. In Jesus' name. Rearrange us. In Jesus' name. Bring us into the presence of a living God like we've never seen before. In Jesus' name. All God's children can say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You can take your copy of God's Word this morning. We can go to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Uh, John, computer operator would be like, oh, uh, John chapter 20. Nineteen through thirty-one. Uh, keep your finger there. Today is is a transition sermon. Uh, this is a five-part sermon series. We got two sermons in the beginning here of of what it means for the outside people looking inside. That's the name of the the message of this series. Outside in. We've been studying what it's like for a person unchurched or on the outside of fellowship how they view us. So we had two sermons viewing. Uh, how they look at us, and we're going to have two more at the end here. But today, today is looking at you. Because if, if the people that are unchurched on the outside have a viewpoint of us that worship, we have to be in a certain mindset in order to be effectively ministering to them. If, if you got what I just said, you can say amen. If we're not, we're not effective. So today is mentality, and the mentality of us is what we're addressing today. And how do you view you? That's the question that's being posed to you today. How do you view you? If there's a positive view of you or a negative view of you, uh, we're going we're gonna to take that apart a little bit. And in order for God to do something in your life, if how many times have you heard a Christian say, well, I'm waiting on God to do this big move in my life. And we say those kinds of things. But in order for God to do a big shift in your life, something has to go. Something has to change. Adam and Eve were in a relationship with God, and he did a big move in them. And he said, listen, you, you can have... All of this is yours. There, were, it was, there was restrictions on it, though, but it wasn't restrictive. They were in the relationship, and there was a big move towards the wrong way in their life. But every time when you study the Word, when God shifts, something changes and something is moved. Abraham uh, became God's servant. He says, the nations are going to come out of you, and he made him move from all his crazy relatives. Then he gave him his son Isaac, and he wanted him to sacrifice Isaac. Big shift. You go a little further in the Old Testament, God came to Noah, and and big shift. Build a boat on dry land. Big moves. So if God's going to move you big, something's got to change. Something's got to happen. It's a process. And that's really what I'm, I'm, I'm touching on right here, is the process will fulfill the purpose But we get stuck in the process. And if you get too caught up in the process, you lose the purpose. But God wants to keep you focused on the purpose. The purpose of this fellowship is to bring the word of God to a lost and dying community. We are called to bring the message to a community. That's the purpose. But if we get stuck in the process, we've lost what we're called to do. Then we become a church for the church. So today, we're looking at you. Can you honestly say, Pastor Lynn, I can look in the mirror and I can see me. And when I see me, there's things in me that need to be changed. When I can see the saved part of me, I can see that the blood of Jesus has covered my sins and I've been changed, I've been, I've been renewed, I'm a brand new person. Can, can you honestly see you? That's where we're going today. 
And we have to be able to stay. I'm not say, I'm not staying right here. I'm, I'm not comfortable with myself right here. And you got to be able to look in the mirror and, and say, you know what, where I'm at today is not where I'm supposed to be. And all of us can say that. And it's, it's not psychological message today, but a lot of it is understanding who you are and to get to the point in life where you can say, where I'm at today is not where God wants me to be. There's something bigger. There's something more. So he's going to move, and when he moves, something has to go. So it's a shift. Ginger and I went through 25 years in agriculture and very content, but I was in the process. And I loved the process. I loved what I was doing, but he had a purpose. And if you get caught in that process, you lose sight of the purpose. So all of a sudden, the process changed, and he pulled us out, and we had to step out in faith because now the process changed because I started to see the purpose. But if you get caught in the process, it gets really stagnant, stale, dead. God says, no, I want you to stay focused on the purpose of what I'm doing in your life. That's why there's more to you than what you're seeing here today. And I'm going to push you on that. I want you to look at self and say, oh, I think there's a little bit more here. I think maybe there's something else. May of 2000, Ginger and I had gone through four months of process, a lot of process, it was in December of, that, of 1999 that we committed to going to the purpose. And for the next five months, we had to go through the process of exiting agriculture, selling the farm, selling the machinery. That was all process. But in, but in May of 2000, the pastor from the town that I did business in, which was five miles away, which was Holstein, that wasn't the town we worshipped in. It was an ELCA church, but we worshipped in an ELCA church that was only three miles away which I had spoken and I was very active in, both of us were. But the pastor in Holstein came to me and he said, you know, you've been part of the ELCA body while you've lived in this community and I would really like you to speak at our church before you leave. And I was like, yeah, cool. So that was part of the process. But I had shifted to seeing the purpose so he calls me to speak. He said, there's two services. I said, yeah, we can do it. And the text that I'm speaking on today is the very text that I spoke on that day. I stepped into the pulpit, and it's elevated like 12 feet off the ground in the old Lutheran churches, you know what I mean? And, I mean, I ain't kidding you. If, if this was the little room, I had to go like this to close the door behind me. So it's like it locks you into this little cage, and there you are, and you look out above the people, and it's like, this is kind of freaky. But it was all part of the process to prepare me for the purpose. I was looking at all the people that I had known in the community for over 15 years, and now all of a sudden I'm speaking to them. Totally different atmosphere. Talk about being way outside of your element. I had done pulpit supply for five years. I had never done it in that town. So I was used to speaking in front of people, but I didn't know the people. It's a little bit different. So in reality, I'm telling you this story is because I was looking at me. These were farmers. This was agriculture. This was a community. This was the manager of the elevator and all, all the people I worked with. They, they were me. And now I'm, I'm in front of them. I tell you what, it's weird. And I got halfway through that message and I lost my place in my notes and I even said that. I don't know what I'm saying. I don't know what I'm doing. And the one guy in the second row, he says, you're doing fine. Just keep going. I'm like, okay, you know. But... It's process. It's process. And it's pushing you towards a purpose. And I share that story with you because I know God has more for each and every one of you sitting here today. But you've got to be willing to stay focused on that purpose. If we lose sight of the purpose, we're in trouble. Mentality. What's your mentality? Guaranteed, most of us sitting here today have a mentality of being discouraged. Maybe you didn't get picked on the team when you were in fifth grade. Maybe the favorite girl that you thought you were going to spend your life with never even turned her head towards your way. Whatever it is, the discouragement, we have a mentality of discouragement. So let, let's go to the text this morning. Laid the foundation there to, to look at self and to grab it and to say, I'm okay, Lord, with the process because I know there's a bigger purpose. John, 19, John 20, verse 19. Uh, Jesus has been crucified, laid in the tomb for three days, rose again. He encounters the Marys in the garden. 
He tells them to go tell the boys, I'm alive. I did what I said I was going to do. And this is the evening of that day. I, you know, I mean, I, I just get chill bumps even just thinking about this. Because here's the disciples hiding out in the upper room. And Mary knew and she told them. And they're freaking out because Jesus flat out told them. He said, listen, if, if they're going to kill me, they're going to come and kill you too. So the, rightly, they're scared. Because, she look at what they did to him. So they're hiding out behind closed doors. And then the same day at evening, this is the same day of the resurrection, beginning the first day of the week when the doors were shut, were the disciple, where the disciples were assembled. Why? Because fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace be with you. Peace be with you today. You know, and in my old background, my old roots... That's how we, we did things. There was part of the liturgical reading where you'd turn to your neighbor and you'd say, peace be with you, you know. There's significance to that. Peace be with you, Jesus says to him. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands, his feet, his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. That, that's all cool right there. How many guys were there? Ten. Judas betrayed Jesus, became guilt-ridden, convicted, hung himself, got spewed out on the ground, the Bible says. We're missing one, so that's eleven. But... Thomas wasn't there either, so there's ten guys there, and that's significant. Now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. Amazing. I mean, he, he's here. We, we've witnessed it. He stood in our midst. And this is not my favorite verb, Adon. This is the physical scene. And, and we... we, we it's not that verb for this reason because it's, it's not, we didn't see him spiritually. We, we seen him in the physical. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. This is the reason I'm going where I'm going today. You've got to be able to look at yourself and answer this question. Unless I put my hand in his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside. They're still hiding out. Thomas was with them this time, so now there's 11 of them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, You know, here's 10 guys. They all seen him, but he goes right to Thomas. He looks right at him. Peace to you, Thomas. Says the same thing he told everybody else, but he's specifically addressing Thomas here. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here, look at my hands, and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Was Jesus, was Thomas there when, when, was Jesus there when Thomas said, unless I put my fingers in his side? He wasn't. God's all-knowing. This is a perfect example of that. So he grabs Thomas's hands and, and he puts his hands in, in his finger holes and in his feet and in his side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered him and said to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. We fall into the category of that verse. We'll get into that. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. This is one of the most fascinating verses to me. We get all wound up in the first book and the second book. And by the way, that's Pastor Lynn's translation of the Old Testament and the New Testament because the Old Testament isn't an Old Testament. It's just another book. And I think we get caught with the old, old, you know. No, it's just the first book and the second book. But he did so many things which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may what? That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John ends his book by saying there's so many things written about Jesus that if we would write them all down, the books wouldn't even fit in the world. So we just get a piece of what he did. 
but he said they're written so that you believe that Jesus is the Christ. And if you're sitting here today and if you've ever questioned, that's the reason we're in a transition sermon. You've got to be able to look into the mirror and say, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Why? Why? Because he said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. You're those people. The, the scene used there in verse 29, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed, is blepo. It's not a don. It's not my favorite verb. It's the verb where you see him in the physical. Now, it's crazy, but I'll explain it to you. Jesus came to them, if you notice in verse 20, and when he had said this, he says, peace be with you. They didn't get it there. Peace be with you, and when he had showed him his hands and his side, then the disciples were glad. Do we have the opportunity to see the risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and put our fingers in his hands and in his feet and in his side? No, but they didn't get it until they actually seen him in the physical. That's when it clicked in their head. Life will push you beyond your limits. They were pushed beyond their limit here. Life will push you into a place where you don't get it. But he says, peace, number one, peace be with you. Once you have the peace of, see, peace comes with salvation. When you're saved, you have peace. I don't care how dark the night is. I don't care how crazy the report from the doctor is. I don't care what's going on in your life. When you're truly a born-again Christian, when, when you're saved, when the Spirit of God lives within you, you have peace. What, everything I've been through in my life, if, if it ain't right, there is no peace. But when you're going through something and you have peace, you understand who Jesus the Christ is. And I'm going to call him Railroad Joe. Uh, that's the nickname I've given him, but he's a gentleman who watches us online. He's been in service a few times. Uh, some of you have met him. Joe Hanneman, he's from Rosselt. Rosselt, Ross, what's the town over there? Rosse. I always get those two mixed up. Uh, wonderful man going through some real hardships in his life. And two weeks ago, he's, he's watching the message online. I asked him if I could tell this story, and he said, however you got to use my life, go ahead. But he, he's, he's watching the message online, and he starts to cry, and he has a peace, total peace. And he said, it was overwhelming peace, and here I am just sitting in my house all alone, and two hours later, the police bring to his house the divorce papers that his wife was wanting but he had peace. You know, he said, why did I have the peace of God at that time? It was for the rest of the day. He went outside and mowed his lawn, totally discombobulated, but he had peace. You see, when life pushes us beyond limits, we can't explain that, but we have a peace. We have a peace. Now, just because you have peace doesn't mean that you get it. See the difference? Because they had the peace of God, but they didn't get it until they witnessed who he was. Now, we're a church that's striving and working hard to be a church where the unchurched love to attend. You know what the unchurched people love to see? Real people. People who get it. People who have been there. People who have done it. People who say, I believe in the love of Jesus. People who are animated in worship, praising God, but they want to see it. Doesn't do us a bit of good to come together and worship in Jesus' name and be all animated and, and doing our thing on Sunday morning. Hey, but if they don't see it, it's not real. See the difference? So when your marriage hits the wall and your marriage goes through the pit and you got scars from it, they see that. And you came out the other side and you have a peace. Now Christianity is real. When, when your kids leave home and, and they're all messed up and they're on drugs and they're who knows where, and, and you're hurting, you're gut-wrenching, being torn apart, but things come back together, or if they don't come back together, you're living with the peace of God and you can witness to the other couple that's going through the same thing. Now, ministry is real. Ministry is not a message. 
I know we come together and, and this is fellowship. This is what we're supposed to do. Hebrews 10, 25 says, do not forsake this. This is where power is at. This is where we learn. But ministry is when they see it in us. When they can see the marriage that was in trouble, they can see the broken family, and they still have peace, they're still walking with Jesus, they're still worshiping God, and then they can come in and they'll say, wow, they've been through that, and they can still do this. See the difference? That's why ministry is not just a message. Until your faith has been tested, it's not faith. You can put faith in faith, but until your faith has really been put to the test... Do you have real faith? So many times, uh, we, we don't get that. And we, we pray to God. We, we say things like, oh, take this from me. I can't endure it anymore. But you know what? God is saying, no, let, let's come on. Because you're being molded. You're being shaped here as you go through this. Because ministry is life. Ministry is the real deal. And then when you come out the other side, you have the peace of God that does surpass your understanding because you walk through the valley of the shadow of death and now there's some evidence like Jesus showed them. He said, listen, I am him. And when they seen the evidence that he was who he was, they got it. And guess what? Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. That's my favorite verb. That's the Adon. They saw it with an understanding. Jesus is here. This is him. And they were like, hallelujah, praise God. This is our Jesus the Christ. So I said all that because one word from God can change your life. One word. Peace be with you. He was standing in front of them. They were able to see it. It changed their life. If you're not here on Sunday morning, if you're not in the Bible study, if you're not in the fellowship, wherever it is during the week, however it looks, and you miss it, you've missed it. You just plain out miss it. One word from God can change your life, and this may be the only place you see that one word from God. Who missed it? Thomas did. One word has the impact that can change eternity for you, and you don't want to miss those opportunities. This is the reason he came for you. Each and every one of you sitting here today, he came for you. And I can say that because of how the rest of the story unfolds. Jesus made a second trip. I mean, put this into perspective. This is the creator of the universe. This is the God who spoke and stuff happened. This is the God who said, let there be light, and there was light. And this is the God who met with ten guys, but there was one guy missing. This is the guy who had 40 days left to walk on planet Earth to set a ministry in place that's going to last until he returns. But he took the time to come back to speak to one guy. I, I, just, I just find that amazing. Because it reassures me that God will come back for one. This, this, is, the, this is the teaching. He says, you know, I got 99 sheep, but one's gone. I'm going to go find him. He came back for Thomas. He is here for you today. You know, a lot of times we come into fellowship, we're praising God. Oh, you know, I wish so-and-so was here. I wish so-and-so would have heard this. No, you're here. You're hearing this. He, he's here for, for you today. And he came back to speak specifically to Thomas. Can you look in the mirror and say, I believe? I mean, can you honestly say that? Because he didn't. I can't do it unless I see him. And if we're going to be a church that ministers to the hurting, we've got to be real. Ministry is not just a message. It's more than that. It's real life. So we've got to be able to get to this point where Thomas says, I want to see it. That's okay. You can demand that. Because Jesus came for you, and he's going to make sure he reveals himself to you in such a way that you get it. Look at how this thing unfolds. Jesus said to them again, and Thomas the twin, he wasn't with them, but then he waits eight days. And then he comes, and then he takes Thomas and puts his hands in his side. Why did Jesus wait eight days? I mean, he's on a mission. He's, he's down to 32 days. You ever do the time frame on that? He had 40 days. He waited eight, and he goes for one. I would go to the arena in, in Fargo and have 50,000 people there. But he goes back to talk to one. Eight is very significant in this text today. And so is the name Thomas. Thomas, in the Greek, first in the Hebrew, Thomas simply means twin. Very few words cross over from Hebrew and Greek and have the exact same meaning. Guess what? Thomas 
does. Thomas means twin. Thomas in the Hebrew means twin. Didymus in the Greek means twin. So when they addressed him, they didn't say Thomas, they said twin. Because there was two? No, we don't have any evidence in Scripture that there were two Thomases, but his name was twin. It's very interesting. The other thing that happens here is Jesus waited eight days. God doesn't put stuff in the Bible just randomly. Well, we'll just throw in there that Jesus waited eight days to go talk to the twin. Eight days is significant because on the eighth day in the Jewish tradition, what did they do to the baby? Circumcised. On the eighth day, they were circumcised under Jewish tradition. Jesus was taken to the temple on the eighth day. The first blood that was shed by Jesus was not on the cross. It was on the eighth day in the temple when he was circumcised. Abraham was told to have his kid, Isaac, circumcised on the eighth day. Thomas means twin. Transformation here is going on. If Thomas means twin, and Jesus purposely waited eight, there's two of them. Right? If there's two people, one of them's in trouble. One of us here today are in trouble. I'm not talking about me, and I'm not talking about you. I mean, there's two of you, and one of you is in trouble. And the eighth day is significant because it's the cutting away of the skin that had no value. You still with me? So if there's two of you, and one of you is in trouble, and the eight days means cutting away of the old... One of you has to go. I firmly believe from Scripture that's why his name was Twin, and that's why Jesus waited eight days. You can't continue to go through life and look in your mirror and say, Hey, I love to worship, and I, I'm doing godly things. I, I'm, this, I'm this super Christian. And you look in the mirror, and you're looking at the wrong person. Because if that's how you're doing it, You've never addressed the real person. One of you has to go. There cannot be a confession of both of you being saved walking the same road. Thomas meant twin. He waited eight days, so it signified the cutting away of the old. When Thomas was able to see Jesus and he believed, one of them died. Right? The unbelief left. The belief now took place. Here's you, right here. Here's the you I can see. I uh, can't, but okay. You're, you're here. Yeah, I, I can see you there. Here's the you I can't see. There's two of every one of us. This is the spiritual. This is the physical. I'm a spirit having a very real human experience. You're not a human having a very real spiritual experience. Where's life? In the spirit. In the unseen. We get all wound up in the physical because we can see it. God says life is in the spiritual. I call things into being which are unseen. That's God. That's our God. He says, I call this into being. I call this life. Yet we have a tendency to live here in the, what we can see. And yet, when you understand being born again, the same thing that happened to Thomas, this person died. It got cut away. Because now he was able to witness the risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and that person's gone. You see, when you confess to be born again, this person's dead. Paul makes that time and time again, especially in Romans. He hammers away at this, the old you has died. So if the old you has died, and you're going through real hardships in ministry, and you come out the other side, and the spiritual you is growing, why are you living here? This is where we got to look in the mirror. This is where ministry begins, because if we live here, we're not effective. You look awesome on the outside, but I want to know what's on the inside. Counseling would call this metaphysical. 
Because if I can speak to the problem in your life, I can get you healed in the spiritual part of your life. It's the same as conscious and unconscious. Many times we don't even get the fact that we're living in the unconscious, but God says, I want you to live in the consciousness of your spiritual life. Now things change. Eight days he waited so we could signify that the old hymn had to be cut away. One of you is in trouble sitting here today. You see, and the church does a really good job at speaking to this person. Do you know one of the main reasons we don't take money in this church that has an earmark on it? Is because this is what it addresses. I'm somebody. You are somebody. But I'm going to call you a somebody when I can see you in the spiritual. See the difference? So we can't, we, we can't get caught as a fellowship where everything is all about what we can see. Everything is about what we can't see. And what's really cool is about unchurched people, guess where, where they see is here. They don't even realize it, but they do. And so do you. One of you is in trouble, and it's got to go today. You cannot keep the old you and say that the new you has come. You want a bipolar, schizophrenic Christian? Tell them they've been saved by grace. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. How about tell them, I'm a poor, miserable sinner saved by grace? Now you've got a schizophrenic Christian because I'm a poor, miserable sinner, but I'm saved by grace. Which one am I, pastor? Saved by grace or, or poor, miserable sinner? No, the blood of Jesus covered me. I've been redeemed. I'm reconciled back to God. That's what compels me. That guy's dead. All we're trying to see here today is that the person behind the person is where life is at. I, I really hope you can, can get this. Because when we get this, the old Thomas was gone. What, what did he say when, when he was able to get this thing? He says, listen, my Lord, my God, you, you killed the old guy, you destroyed him, I'm brought into the new. There's two of you. There's two of you. So let me just push you a little bit further on this whole topic. Which one do you identify with the most? These guys walked with Jesus. They watched him heal people. They watched him bring sight to the blind. He ministered to 5,000 people. And all through the process, they were identifying with the physical. They even had their mother, the sons of thunder. They even had mom ask Jesus, who's going to sit at the right? Who's going to sit at the left? Because it was a physical kingdom. Jesus is going to usher into this awesome thing, come in on a white horse, and we're going to overthrow the Romans, and it's all in the physical. Thomas was still caught there. Unless I see this thing, I don't get it. It was all in the physical. Which one do you identify with? Do you identify with your saved-again spirit? Or do you identify with what you can see? This is intense. Because as long as you're still identifying with the fallen part that you claim is cut away, you're given a very confusing message. Because people see two sides of you. Multiplicity. Who are you? Nobody has a clue who's behind the smile. This young lady right here gave a wonderful testimony on New Year's last year of what it's like to live a life behind a smile and how hard and how painful that is. And all of us have those stories. And if, if we're a body of fellowship who confesses to believe in the risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we can get behind the smile and we can see who you are. That's what he was asking Thomas to do. And some of you are dragging around a carcass that died years ago. And you're still dragging him around. Come on up, carcass. This is my carcass. So really, really what's happening here, we'll go this way, is this is my carcass. This is Pastor Lynn that died. This is the old me that was gone. He's, he's gone. And I'm, I'm living in the Spirit. So who's in front? I'm led by the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm moving in the spiritual realm of my life, in the conscious awareness. And carcass, he's back there. However... If when the enemy tempts you, and you, you can't be in the praise team, you can't speak a word, you can't do that, all of a sudden this turns around and I start to follow carcass. 
how effective am I am following a dead guy? Right? Thanks, carcass. <laughs> We do that in life. We follow carcass. And I don't say that lightly. Because if, if, if you're saved, you're a born-again believer, you can come into a fellowship like this and say, praise God, there's new life. And I see it. I don't have to drag carcass around. Now, here's the other thing that happens. You know what carcass does? You don't have to go to church. Carcass says, you don't have to tell the truth. The IRS will never know you got that money. Don't put that on your tax form. Did that for 25 years. Didn't get an amen on that one. <laughs> We've all been there. That's listening to carcass. I don't have to tell my wife the truth. It was just a one-night deal. I was in Las Vegas at a meeting. Nobody will ever know. Carcass is talking. I thought Carcass was dead. He still got a voice. This side of glory, he still lives in the physical. He still talks all the time. If you live in a world where you're being drugged by Carcass, you will never be the person God has called you to be. Can't happen. This is transformation from the division. He came to cut away the old into clear vision of understanding who he is. This actually even gets a little more intense because we fall into the category in verse number 29 of those who have not seen. Now, I, I want to explain this just a little bit further because here's what happens. We, we, we get this today, okay? Okay. Pastor Lynn, I understand the old me's gone, the new me has come. Uh, I'm not going to listen to carcass. I'm, I'm going to live in the spirit, and I'm cool, and, and it's all good, and I'm believing in God, and the wife still leaves. I'm, I'm believing in God. I get this thing, but I still lost my job. See, that's what happens. Because then all of a sudden we're saying we're doing it, but then something happens in life, and, and it goes sideways. And now we're really in trouble because the preacher taught me from the text that if I believe in God and I see Jesus for who he is, that I don't listen to carcass anymore, life is going to be good, right? No, you're still living on this side of glory. Stuff still happens. But that's the reason he says, peace be unto you. Because you can go through life and incur those trials and hardships and troubles and pain and depression and all what have you and go on down the list, but you still have the peace. Because you're not living in carcass world, you're living in spirit world, you're living in the saved world. God has got way too much invested in you to leave you high and dry. He came back for Thomas, he's here for you today. He'll come back for one. And that's what he did, and that's what he continues to do. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Live there. Look in the mirror and see that this is going to turn to worm food. I'm called to take care of this body. I'm called to do what I've, I've got to do with this body. But in the meantime, this isn't where it's at. It's my spiritual man. You can't see Pastor Lynn. You cannot see me. The part of me that will live forever. However, when they were able to see Jesus in the physical, that's when they got it. So, if they were able to see him in the physical and get it, how can the unchurched come in and see this thing and be alive and real? How do they experience that? Okay, put on your thinking caps for a minute. Jesus stood in front of them in the physical form, right? Object. Object. Objective. Okay, so they had an objective faith. It was in the object named Jesus the Christ. Right? It's not going to get too complicated, but I just want you to get this. When they were able to put... Carcass, come back up for a minute. When they were able to put their hand in the hole and your hand in the hole and your hand in the side, they got it. Right? 
It wasn't until then that they got it. However, he says, Thomas, blessed be you because you got to see me uh, and, and your carcass helped you get it. But blessed are those who never get to see. How can the unchurched get to see? Remember where I started? The unchurched get to see when they come to church and they put their hand in your hand. And they are touched by another person by a hug. If you believe that you're a born-again believer, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, you are touching the hand of God. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. So, right now, Grab the hand of the person sitting next to you. See, we don't have a crisis of unbelief in our lives. We have a crisis of connecting the physical with the seen. But Jesus says, blessed are those who did not get to see me and still believe. So they had a faith in the object named Jesus. Jesus died walked on the earth for 40 days, he ascended into heaven. Your faith now moves into the subjective. We don't get to see him in the physical. You have the subject. How many times have you told me it's called grace? His name is Jesus. Where do we get to see him? It's in the face of the believers. You are holding the hand of a believer and you get to see Jesus and the fellowship. Don't ever come in to a fellowship and think, I'm just here today. You bring the presence of God. And when that non believer or that marginal believer sits next to you, you are the hand of God, you're the face of Jesus. Do they get to experience that, see that, feel that? They do. I know some of you are thinking, Pastor Lynn, I'm really ugly. I don't look that great. I'm 80 pounds overweight. I didn't wash my hair this morning. I got head lice, whatever it is. <laughs> I haven't bathed for two weeks. I've been out on the line. Who knows what? It's not in that. It's not in that. It's in that spiritual, subjective faith. It's not even mystical. It's real. You're warm. You're tangible. And they feel that. So folks, Jesus said, blessed are those who believe, even though they never get to see me. I firmly believe he was teaching they will get to see me through this through this. So from now on, as you go, as you fellowship, as you worship, subconsciously remind yourself, carcass is dead. Don't live your life listening to a dead man. Live your life listening to the Spirit of God. Blessed are those who did not get to see. Live your life in the spiritual realm. And say, thank you, Jesus, for who I am. I know I'm going to be standing with you face to face someday. In the meantime, I'm the face, I'm the hands, I'm the hugs of the risen Savior. And you will change people's lives. Don't get caught in the process, but keep your focus on the purpose. And once you remember the purpose, you can stand in the pulpit with the door slamming you in the butt, and you can speak a word to anybody, anywhere, at any time. Because God says, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, I will never leave you alone, I have your back all the time. I got way too much invested into you. You confess to believe in me, my son died for you. Is that an investment? It's a big one. Amen. Amen. Let's pray.
Let's pray holding hands. As a body of Christ, we are a unified body. So we can hold each other's hands and be reminded that we are one in the Spirit. Father, we thank you today for the fact that you came and, and you, you purposely came back to speak to Thomas. And Father, we thank you for the very fact that you will make an appointment to come back to each and every one of us. If there's anybody sitting here today that feel they have been left alone, that you haven't spoke to them, I know that you are a God who is speaking to them today that say, I have came, I come for you. If you're feeling abandoned, if you're feeling alone, and you're thinking right now, Pastor Lynn, how am I supposed to be the hands and feet of Christ? That's carcass. Let the Holy Spirit swell up in you. And honestly, honestly, I'm going to give you a moment of meditation. Look into that mirror and say, am I feeding the carcass or am I living in the Spirit? And if you're feeding carcass, go ahead and list off what you're feeding them. It's probably some pride. You really want to be somebody at work. You really want to be somebody in your family. You want to be that one with the knowledge and the wisdom to make these changes. If you're feeding carcass... Go ahead and list it off because right behind it, if you're a born-again believer, the Holy Spirit says Jesus died for all of your sins and they're all gone. I give you that time. Father, thank you for the cleansing work you've done today. Fill us with your spirit where there's a void from an old pattern, old way. Fill us so completely that it spills out over into that hand that we're touching. Father, move through these connected hands. Let your love flow. There's some hands touching another hand right now that hurts. Life has beat them up. They've never heard a message that they were able to have a faith in a God that they can actually touch and feel. Father, build this fellowship in such a way that they're so ignited, they're, they're so energized, they're so filled with the peace of God that nothing will keep them away. thank you for the healing you've done here today. I thank you for the resurrected Lord and Savior Jesus. I thank you that he walked on the earth for 40 days, presented himself to the world, that he is God, he is alive. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. You've, you've ensured our place there that when we pass from this life to the next, we'll be there. We thank you for it. In the meantime, Use us in a powerful way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. Spiritual, don't leave here dragging carcass with you. Don't pick him up. So many people do. You come to this point in the service and it's all good, and then by the time you get to the car, he's back on your back. Leave him lay. And the next time something's supposed to happen in your life in ministry and Carcass talks to you, Carcass, you're dead. I don't listen to you anymore. You don't have to go to church. Carcass, I don't listen to you. Blah, 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 blah.